Uh, uh, next up, we have uh, Jim Fallows of The Atlantic, whom you all know, interviewing uh, the person who started Uber and has given us a clean, smooth ride in Washington. Not yet in New Orleans, by the way, Mayor Landrieu, so maybe we can fix that in the green room. Uh, Trevor Kalanick. Uh, and by the way, I think we've made a verb out of it, because this morning I was getting an Uber and I said, listen, I think I, think I want to do some Ubering this morning rather than wait for a cab. So welcome. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Thank you all for coming here. Thanks to Travis Kalnick for, uh, for founding Uber and for also coming to, to, to join us. I think for a crowd like this in D.C., Travis is an extremely interesting case because it's a tech story we're all interested in, a business story we're all interested in. It's a product many people here have used, and there's a political story, too, you have. First, how many people here in the audience have used Uber? So I can't see very well, but it looks like almost everybody. How many people like Uber? How many right. people have complaints or qualms about Uber, which we'll try to get hands to down. during our... Hands down. <laughs> so there, there are at least, at least a couple up there. I got discounts for people who don't raise their hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Travis is from LA, from, from UCLA. Tell us briefly the basic idea, when you decide you're gonna find, found this kind of company. I mean, this is what I call the hand of, the hand of forehead moment, um, or palm to forehead moment. Uh, I'm from San Francisco, I live in San Francisco, from LA originally. Um, and it's hard to get a ride in San Francisco. So we just wanted, me and my co-founder just wanted to push a button and get a ride. <laughs> well, gee, you know, it's so obvious, why didn't we think of that? So where, you're now operating all around the world, where has this worked best and where is it not working? I mean, we're three and a half years old and we didn't even go to a second city until two years ago, and that was New York. What is probably one of the most remarkable things about this rollout and these launches in cities around the world is that it's working everywhere. I mean, there's certainly political situations that are more interesting than others. Phoenix is awesome. Yeah. DC <laughs> is a real pain in my butt. <laughs> but uh, but it fundamentally works, and it's because there is a, there's been protectionism ingrained into cities around the world um, that has limited people's choices for getting around the city. To give a perfect example, in New York there are 13,250 cabs or they're about today. In the early 1950s, there were 13,250 uh, cabs, yeah. right? So the city has changed, it's grown, it's dynamic city, but the taxis have stayed the same. And so when we go into a city, it's like, it's like an injection of oxygen and people just breathe it and what happens is the growth we've seen with Twitter, or Facebook, or some of these yeah. others, we're seeing now happen with technology that touches the real world. And I think a really interesting issue for policymakers, especially on the local level, is how technology is getting into places that are thought of traditionally as city services, right. and how we're disrupting, in some ways, regulatory uh, regimes um, because of it. Yeah. So because we're here in D.C. now, I want to f explore a couple applications, uh, implications of your work here. How many people were involved in the social media campaign about Uber regulation in D.C.? I know I received many emails. I assume a number of you, you, uh, you did. An email. So was the political struggle here typical of your expansion around the U.S. or was it an aberration? What happened here, it, this was the first place it happened. Yeah. So just to give you a little context, uh, started with a guy named Ron Linton, who's the taxi commissioner here in DC. Um, the laws here at the time were incredibly clear that Uber was legal, um, but that didn't stop him from starting to impound people's cars, okay? Uh, but the law supported us, so he couldn't really do it because court cases would go against yeah. him, et cetera. So then they created a law, which basically was called the Uber Amendment, and the rationale in black and white in the Uber Amendment was we cannot let sedan companies compete with the taxi industry. And the specifics of the law were, we are going to make the minimum fare for a sedan in DC five times the minimum fare yeah. of a taxi. That was rolled out at 4 p.m. on a Monday for a vote at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday. And I wrote an email between the hours of 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. and sent it to all of our riders in DC. And in the 18 hours after that, 
there were 50,000 emails sent to city council people on behalf of our, our customers sent those emails. Uh, 37,000 tweets and 104 million social media impressions. Yeah. And the Uber amendment was rescinded. <laughs> so. And, and, and I, I always think, I think it was because there was one powerful blog entry on the Atlantic site. I think that's what turned that it around. That was actually yeah. what started the whole thing. Um, but what happened is, is what we did here in DC and what we ultimately have had to do multiple times in DC because Ron Linton loves him some taxi guys um, is we created a playbook, right? That now is something we do when we have problems like that in other cities. And so DC was really the first place, it's almost ironic, it was the first place, but now we've done it in Milan and Paris and Stockholm, uh, many cities here in the US, we did Dallas recently, um, where they try to slip in language last minute that tries to put us out of business. Yeah. Every time I take an Uber ride or a normal taxi ride, I always ask the drivers about the effect of, of Uber. And what's interesting to me as a DC resident is the class war overtones you get on both sides of that. That the people who are against Uber think it's a tool for the yuppies and that the, ca the class of drivers is different. They're mainly younger, it's a different sort of ethnicity, a different immigrant groups from the, the taxi drivers, and there's a resentment among a lot of the established taxi drivers. How do you view this class war applica uh, implication of Uber's spread? Uh, first, so uh, there's, mo there's a lot packed into that question. Yeah. The first thing is that Uber, when we roll out into a city, starts at the high end, right? It's like we didn't just want to push a button and get a ride. We wanted it to be a classy ride. Yeah. That's where we start. But our motto is everyone's private driver. And so we roll out lower cost services. In fact, UberX here in, in the district is, I think, 20% cheaper than a taxi, mm -hmm. something like this, right? So that's getting far, that's getting a lot further than taxis could go in terms of the market. Point is, is that even when it's for the high end, right? What people need to realize is that 80% of that fare is going to the driver. Mm -hmm. And so there's a job story here. You're talking about thousands of jobs in every city we roll into that basically are created because we're there. And so there's that part of it. And then of course, because we come down market, um, this becomes a transportation option that's not just for rich people but it's for people who actually couldn't get transportation before because they couldn't afford it. This is actually more affordable transportation. Um, and I think on both sides that there's really, it becomes a non-story. And then the, the last part of this is, um, oh shoot, I forgot what I was gonna about, say. Uh, about the drivers, sort of. Oh yeah, the drivers. So, you know, especially when you start providing multiple options at multiple mm -hmm. price points, the, the story around, well, drivers are different in taxis versus Ubers, I, I don't, that's not been my experience. Um, and, you know, I see it across a lot of cities. What we see is that, in fact, a lot of taxi drivers moving across mm -hmm. um, because they can make a better living and they can run their own business. We have a number of drivers who've been scrappy with one car, have grown to 15, 20. So one guy's got 25 cars in San Francisco, right? He's running a multi million dollar business, he's got six kids, and now he's putting his eldest daughter through school at Stanford. Yeah couldn't do that otherwise. And you definitely couldn't have done that driving a taxi. So the, the San Francisco, the Bay Area, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, not, I was gonna say like you, but not like you. You're more successful than, than nearly any of them. But most of them, in my experience, are sort of either uninterested in or naive about politics. It's striking that Uber has had a technological and a marketing and a political sophistication all the way along. You're doing yeah. ward healing politics at the same time you're doing GPS locations. Why is that? How do you do it? Look, I, I wouldn't call myself sophisticated. I would call myself naive <laughs> about politics, but it's because of that that we win. Because when I go and talk to somebody, like anybody, it can be a, it can be a governor, a mayor, city council person, a regulator, I stand up for what we believe in and our principles. And, and because we have gen, general managers in all these cities that really run the show and do the day to day, you know, we have to basically, I have to basically teach them what I call principled confrontation. <laughs> and it's very, unsophisticated <laughs> and it's not politics as usual but it's like here are our principles we're willing to compromise but only if we agree with your principles and when your principles are reduce options for citizens so they can't get around the city reduce options for drivers so that they're impoverished and make the city generally a worse off place there's not a lot to compromise on right so to give me an example uh, Miami right now if you we're not operating in Miami because we're not legal in Miami. 
the, the laws just don't allow us, they outlaw competition. If I, if I pick up a phone, because that's what you gotta do in Miami, and call a town car and it comes in 10 minutes, by law I have to stare at that town car for 50 minutes more before I'm legally allowed inside the vehicle. If I get in that vehicle before an hour has passed, I am committing a crime. So, you know, this is, you know, they could say, well, why don't we split the difference and make it 30 minutes? <laughs> like, no, that's, that's, not, that's not how we roll, yeah. right? So actually, we have our own approach to things, and I think it's going to be an approach that I think comes more and more to local governments as technology works into these places that are highly regulated. The high regulation has created environments where there's been stagnation for decades, like I described in yeah. New York with the taxis. And so it becomes ripe for disruption. So then the tech comes in, it moves faster than regulatory regimes can move or control it, let's say. Uh, and, then, and then now you've got a situation where you know, people are scrambling. Yeah. There's a really fascinating middle ground that Uber occupies. On the one hand, you're, you're trying to be much more innovative than the purely regulated uh, organizations like the former taxi monopolies. On the other hand, you're subject to regulations that the purely ride-sharing companies, like, for example, Lyft in San Francisco occupy. How do you see your extension of this model into other fields? Do you imagine that the Uber model of disintermediating and disrupting, is this gonna go into things other than tra urban transportation? You know. Uber's model is not inherently let's mess with city governments, okay? That, that's just a, a, a side benefit, right? It's just, a, <laughs> that's the icing on the cake. <laughs> um, Uber's model is what I, you know, at the, at the highest level is uh, lifestyle cross with logistics. Lifestyle is give me what I want and give it to me right now. What we're used to on the, on the internet for a long time, I click and I get a video or whatever. But logistics is delivering it. So now we're bringing that lifestyle of give me what I want, give it to me right now, and we're bringing it to the real world. And so that's what we do. We're in the business of delivering cars in five minutes. But once you're delivering cars in five minutes, there's a lot of things you can deliver in five minutes. And that's kind of how we look at it. And have you thought consciously about what some of those other things might be? Sure. On Valentine's <laughs> Day the last couple of years, sure. <laughs> we did on-demand roses. Right? So, you know, you, you're a guy. You're pretty forgetful about Valentine's Day. I get it. You open up your Uber app, you push a button, and in five minutes a bouquet of roses comes, and you are a frickin' hero. Yeah. <laughs> so we, I call that scaling romance. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did uh, on-demand ice cream in July, so yep. you push a button and an ice cream truck comes, and all of a sudden you become an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> uh, and so there's things like that that we do for marketing purposes, but it captures the imagination and, and in so many ways is what Uber is about. Here is a, and you had kittens also, right? Yeah, we did on-demand kittens. I, <laughs> we called it five, minute, five minutes of cuddles, kitten cuddles. The problem is scaling kitten delivery, <laughs> like the supply chain's messed up because what happens is, <laughs> is in a year, those kittens become cats. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really problematic. <laughs> I, I, here's a fine-grained point about the rating system. You know, you have uh, the, the driver has to give the passengers uh, five, uh, four or five-star ratings and, and vice versa. Often these systems become corrupted because if it's not five stars, it's nothing. How does the rating system work? What have you observed about the way it operates? Well, the, 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 the bottom line with the rating system is that it's highly predictive. And what I mean by that is in large numbers. Right, so people get worried about the specific rating that they give on a particular driver, but honestly, that's not what it's about. It's about, it's about thousands of people rating that particular driver. Um, and what you get is if the guy's a 4.9, I say if you get in the car with a 4.9 driver, you're getting in the car with an artist. Because you get in that car and you don't know why, but you feel better. This is the only way he got a 4.9. Only 2% of the people get, get that, and it's, I can't explain it. I feel good too. Um, but in 4.8 is competent, 4.7 is solid, 4.6, decent, 4.5 is when it starts getting a little hairy, like you may not know the city, things like that. So the bottom line is that it's very predictive, and based on that, we can use it to determine who's providing bad service and good service. Folks who are providing poor service, we can't partner with, and those accounts uh, typically get deactivated. And so, so it often is, um, as an Uber customer, I often wonder how you balance supply and demand. That, 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 that's, uh, how, do these how are you ch uh, tuning these algorithms as time goes on? So at our company, we have uh, what I call the math department. Now, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a computer engineer 
computer scientist uh, background at UCLA before I dropped out. Um, <laughs> anyways, I thought that'd be funny. Um, okay, so, uh, so I still sort of directly uh, manage or get involved with that team. Um, but basically, it seems magical. You push a button and a car comes in five minutes, but how do you make sure that happens? You have to know where to, you have to predict demand ahead of time. And you, you have to make sure there's the right number of cars on the system at the right time. That also includes predicting traffic, because how long is it gonna take for a car to get there can affect all the trips that happen throughout the day. Of course, then you have to make sure that the cars are in the right place. There's a supply positioning problem. When demand outstrips supply, because there's a spike yeah. uh, in demand, then you let the price come up so that more cars come on the system, so more rides happen. Um, that all gets wound together into basically a logistics yeah. platform. And, and how big is the reserve army of drivers who aren't on the system when it's the normal rate, but they are when it's surge pricing? Well, look, I, you know, it depends on every city and how old the city is and the dynamics of that city, but the bottom line is, you know, people sleep, they do, you know, they, they, they go hang out with family or they go to restaurants or whatever, just like everybody else. And, and so, you know, there's encouragement, let's say they, you know, they're like, ah, I'm not gonna work today, uh, I'm gonna take today off, or I'm only gonna work a few hours, and then a, a surge event happens of some sort, they'll stay on the system longer or come out when they didn't before. Yeah. You have lived by disruption so far, and, and what most of us you hear a, a, as a positive way. What is conceivably the disruption you most fear? What is the threat that could emerge that could take Uber's model away? I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> so, so I'll ask you then a, a DC-oriented question. People here, a lot of people in the audience, when they're not riding in your cars, they're thinking about national policy in one way or another. Yeah. Is anything about your business to the good or to the bad been affected by the machinery of government at the national level over the, last, over the four years you've been in existence? Uh, I mean, it's lack, lack of involvement from the federal side makes my life harder, right? Because then I gotta go take, take regulatory situations down city by city. Like I'd love to find some interstate commerce thing or some like, you know, the signals going up to a server in another state and then coming down and like, Ubers in San Francisco, I'm trying to find some angle where I can just say all this corrupt stuff is, like comes down to the federal mm -hmm. thing, but we really haven't spent a lot of time on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing, the lesson to be learned, like I, I guess where we're coming from, I was getting to it earlier, is that technology is getting into cities. It's getting into physical things that cities usually have purview of. Regulatory systems move slow, creates an opportunity for disruption, tech companies come in, and because of the transparency that exists on the internet today, the world knows when backroom deals are happening. And that is what we point out with our social media campaigns, right? right? When, and because of that, it means that two, one of two things happens. Either, you know, either the city gets smart and they change the laws, or they have to get really hardcore about enforcing really bad laws. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of cities we're seeing right now what I call a regulatory ambiguity phase, mm -hmm. where they like what Uber stands for, but they don't have the political capital or political will or whatever, or the taxi guys have paid for decades of lobbyists, et cetera, to get the laws in the right place or to keep the laws in the right place, for instance. And, and that becomes a really interesting dynamic that I think policymakers in cities, states, and federal have to think about because technology is coming after you in the next five years. That is, our time has hit exactly zero as we get that, that rousing point. So there's more I'd like to ask you, but I'm gonna have to ask you off stage. Please join me now in thanking Travis Kalanick.